What the hell is up with Sandy Alcantara? This is Locked On Marlins, baby. You are Locked On Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings from England. Welcome to Locked On Marlins. This, of course, it is your daily Marlins podcast. I'm your host, Peter Pratt. Hit me up on Twitter at Miami Marlins underscore UK. If you're listening to the pod, hit subscribe firstly. Leave a review also. The other thing, this is, of course, your team every day. And thanks for making Locked On Marlins your first listen of the day. There is a YouTube channel. Head on over to there. If you are already watching on the YouTube version, you will see. I have a guest. Ryan is in the house. Ryan, how are we doing, brother? Doing good. Trying to keep my spirit up after the Marlins lost that series. But as uh, Tupac and Paul Severino once said, you got to keep your head up. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, the most amazing connection ever. Tupac and Paul Severino. Sever, I hope you're listening. I hope you're doing well, brother. Um, but there you go. Ryan has called it out. You, you guys coin in the same phrase, which I love to see. Um, before we get into it, and there's tons to get into, Fundamentally, the question we'll get into here is, what is up with Sandy? Um, is there anything up with Sandy? We're going to really dig into that in this uh, this episode, which is post-game after the Marlins just dropped it and the series against the Blue Jays. Um, however, this episode is sponsored by our good friends over at Game Time. You can download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONMLB for 20 bucks off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right, Ryan, we... Let's start with the big picture before we really dig into Sandy. And the Marlins lose this series 2-1 after starting unbelievably with an 11-0 victory in game one. For me, I mean, that was the game I was worried about. This is this is just baseball, right? I was worried about game one. Brian Hoeing going, thinking this could be a tough ask. Thinking, I wonder if the Marlins can then squeak the next two. It went completely the opposite way around. Main overall summary or assessment for you of this series? Yeah, I'd say it's one of the most odd series this entire season for the Marlins. As, you know, I knew it was going to be tough. Even my dad said with Hoeing going against Barrios, who is kind of the Blue Jays' co-ace with Kevin Gossman, who pitched today, uh, Mm -hmm. with one of their aces going, it was going to be tough to hit Barrios, especially when you probably will have to kind of fight against the Blue Jays' offense kind of – in a race to who can score more runs with Brian Hoeing pitching, but Hoeing pitched four great frames and they ended up somehow miraculously shutting out the Blue Jays for the first time that the Blue Jays have been shut out uh, in over 90 games dating back to last season. Uh, But, and then the even more surprising part was that they were really able to hit Jose Barrios and uh, they ended up winning this game 11, nothing. The Blue Jays had to bring in a position player for the final inning. They added on one more run to make it 10 0 to 11 0. And then the next two games, going into the next two games, you were feeling very confident with Yuri and Sandy on the mound. And Yuri pitched great, but the Marlins couldn't score any runs. They get shut out. And then today, it was kind of a very weird game for Sandy because, again, in six of the seven innings, he was dominant. But then that one awful inning in the second inning, he gave up five runs, and that cost him his entire start because he had such a bad inning. It's crazy how he was able to recover through the game and act, settle in after that horrible inning. But when you give up five runs in an inning, you can't really save yourself too much. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's just been the script. The 2023 script of Sandy has just been this one blow-up inning. It There was a period where it felt like it was happening at the back end of the starts where we were all, I say we were all, but for the everyday is listening, they would have heard me talking about it. Like it felt like Skip left him a little bit too long early in the year. And then, he, you know, an amazing start would be spoiled by one blow up inning. Now it's become, you just don't know when the inning's going to happen, but it does happen. And it seems to happen almost every start. I mean, the question we're asking here is, What's going on? Has anything changed with Sandy? Is anything, is there anything that we can actually put our finger on at this point? Because we're all sitting here scratching our heads going, what the hell has happened to Sandy Alcantara in 2023? 
Yeah, it's been incredibly weird, and nobody really knows, but I think the most obvious answer is that Sandy has been hurt a lot by the shift restrictions this year because last year he wasn't a strikeout pitcher. He would have some games where he would rack up nine or ten strikeouts or even eight, but he's never really been a strikeout pitcher. He's been more of a ground ball dominant pitcher. He loves using his change up, his slider, Mm -hmm. and he loves pitching to the weak ground balls, but now these ground balls are getting through the infield, and some ground balls, like we saw an RBI single today, it, it was a ground ball that probably would have been a double play if you could shift on the right-handed hitter last year, but they have to have two guys on each side of second base. So that ended up being an RBI single instead of a ground ball, six, four, three double play. And again, it's very, very frustrating. And that's the main reason. But another thing I wanted to throw into the air, a lot mm-hmm. of people will be having conversations about this in the next uh, one or two weeks is Jacob Stallings. If Sandy's oh. struggling like this and his ERA is over five, his ERA to be exact is 5.08. If Sandy has an over five ERA, you know, you can't keep his personal catcher in there. You have to try something different. And Nick Fortes, who has been catching three out of every five Marlins games, uh, and he catches uh, three out of the five starters. Yep. Maybe you have to give him a chance to catch uh, Sandy because he's never really caught Sandy before. It's always been Stallings. Mm-hmm. Fortes has not caught Sandy once this year, and Stallings caught Sandy every single start during his Cy Young season last year, and he was great. People credited him a lot, but this year, you know, you got to look at solutions, and one of the solutions, well, the possible solutions, could be bringing in Fortes to catch Sandy. <laughs> Yes, yeah, an interesting one, isn't it? Because you're trying to work out, put your finger on, like, what is going on? And what are the possible changes you can make? I mean, one of them could be you go with an opener with Sandy. But, it, you know, one of the most obvious, I think, is the, maybe the catching tandem. I do wonder just generally with Jacob Stallings, like, again, today, you know, there was some at-bats where there was some some relatively big spots. Like, the Marlins, they, they do pretty well at getting guys on base as we can see by their granted a double play stats this year, um, uh, you know, with Stallings, to your point, like if if he's Sandy's personal catcher and it's not going well, there's no offense there. You know, where do the Marlins go with Jacob Stallings? The, you know, they've already talked about it. You know, we've heard rumors that they're, you know, looking for upgrades at the catching spot. I mean, you know, does Jacob Stallings make it past the deadline with the Marlins here at this point? Like, can we see a potential DFA situation? And just to kind of go on to that, one broader question for you um, is a lot of the free agents here for the Marlins that they've signed are underperforming. And there's some decisions to make. The Reds across town in the Central are making some hard decisions. They're making them well, and they're winning a lot of games. The, The decisions they're making is to DFA some guys that they've committed money to. They're not afraid to to make those decisions. So the question is, aside from Stallings more generally, is who could be DFA'd first? Or could there be multiple guys as well? Jacob Stallings, Gene Segura, Johnny Cueto, Avicel Garcia. All four of those guys, which is a a poor situation for the Marlins, are definitely DFA candidates. Who goes first and how many of them do go in 2023? Yeah, it's going to be very tough to see what Kim Ang has to do because she's been so good with these trades, but you have... Well, Stallings came from the trade, but and you didn't have to give up much for him, nor are you paying him a lot. But he could be he's probably the easiest out of those four to DFA, along with Cueto, who is making not a lot, but kind of a decent amount for Marlin standards. I think they did overpay him a little bit. He's uh, definitely a wash pitcher with all the only really benefit you have from him is that he just has experience in the major leagues. He's their most mm. experienced pitcher. Him and Yuli Guriel are the oldest people on the roster, but uh, if he's pitching that bad, there's not really even a benefit <laughs> no. of at all of him uh, having experience if he just can't pitch. And to go to Stallings, I mean, I think it's a 100% chance that you're going to have to DFA him or trade him. It'll be hard to trade him, though, so I wouldn't really count on it because there's no team that really gets any value from Stallings, you know. His defense was where his main value came from when we traded for him. I believe we traded yeah. Cameron Meisner and another prospect uh, to the Pirates to get Stallings. He was a gold glover in 2021. His defense did not look bad at all in 2022. 
with no past balls at all. He was very consistent and working well with Sandy this year. Uh, he's had some past balls. He can't throw out a runner. And he has uh, – I don't know how good he's been working with Sandy, but Sandy hasn't been good. So you can't really tell if he's still helping Sandy at all. And no. it's it's very tough with Jacob Stallings. And now that he can hit, he's gotten worse in hitting in 2023 compared to 2022. His defense is awful. He has zero value. I would think you just have to DFA him, and maybe he'll get picked up by some team as a minor league depth piece. That's how low it's gotten for Jacob Stallings. There's another team – might pick him up, uh, but I think you're going to have to DFA him, and either that will come around at the trade deadline, which we will we are not far away from the deadline where he would get DFA'd if we trade for someone, or we DFA him, and maybe we give a guy uh, like Paul McIntosh a chance, who I think is currently on a rehab assignment. Yep. So uh, maybe we could see Paul McIntosh in the majors because a lot of people are devaluing his defense, saying that he's not a good defender. But if he could even hit like 230 in the majors with uh, okay defense, I would take that. Yeah, I think the pressure is really heating up on Jacob Stallings now at this point. Like just contractually where we're at there, there's an extra, there's one more year of arbitration. So, you know, if the Marlins want it, they have that year of control in arbitration. Um, he's earning $3.35 million this year. Um, but to your point though, Ryan, like there's just no value with Stallings at this point. Maybe there's hidden value. That's the only thing with him is their hidden value in terms of what we don't see. What we see on the field, there's no value right now, but there may be stuff off the field. That's the only thing I think of because let's be totally honest, this Marlins team generally, I would say has overperformed this year and they have found ways to win when it's looked improbable, almost impossible for the Marlins to win. So something in that in that clubhouse, in this culture, is kind of clicking. And which is why I'm kind of pleased they've left Avicel Garcia out in the pasture, um, you know, not really rushing him back. And maybe Jacob Stallings is a bigger piece of the puzzle than what we see on the field. So maybe that's one of the reasons they keep him around. I don't know, but... Greg Mish was talking about it in a recent article. The Marlins are seeking catch and upgrade. So what that says to me is Fortez is not risk. Jacob Stallings is. And so if the Marlins are seeking upgrades, then they're perfectly happy to move on from Stallings. They have really and haven't had any internal options because either they've been hurt or there are no other options. But to your point, maybe Paul McIntosh, after a bit of a rehab here, maybe they just flip the script here and get McIntosh up there and, and just see what he's got. Because right now you can't do any worse than Jacob Stallings, which is pretty wild considering the trade they made, uh, like you said, in that 2021 off season. Um, let's talk about our good friends over at game time. Get the first ad rolling. Um, I also wanted to um, talk about some of your other takeaways from that series more generally. Um, I also want to talk about Uri Perez because boy, oh boy, I know we touched on it, but Uri Perez is just doing things that I didn't even expect. And I'm probably his biggest fan, second biggest, maybe apart from Danny DeVivo. Um, so we're going to talk about Uri Perez as well. Um, but our good friends over at Game Time, um, guys, listen, buying tickets to your favorite events, it should not be stressful. It shouldn't. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, theater, and more. They've got killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guaranteed. You can stop stressing over tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have. You don't have to plan months in advance. You don't. Game time has got deals on tickets right up to the day. All the flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, concerts, comedy theater, and more. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. You can't say fairer than that. You really can't. What have you got to do? Pretty simple. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On MLB. That is all in caps, all one word. Locked On MLB. Twenty bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code Locked On MLB for twenty bucks off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Glorious. All right, Ryan. Any other major takeaways from this series, mate? Because, like you said, it was a funky one. Um, I must say. My general assessment of the Blue Jays, having seen them for three games, is they burgled this series. They didn't look that impressive, 
I'm concerned about their ability to make the postseason in 2023. I didn't think they looked great offensively in particular. I don't think they looked great, which is surprising because you mentioned coming into the, uh, the series, they haven't been shut out once for over 90 games. But I must say something didn't kind of look right with the Blue Jays. But apart from that, uh, I mean, maybe that was your takeaway, but is there anything else you can put your finger on here with this series? Any standouts? I mean, Luis Arias continues to do his thing, but um, what else were you seeing? Well, I think uh, my biggest standout from this series was probably Joey Wendell, who was actually able to get some hits. I believe he had a two-hit game today. I'll just double-check that real quick. Joey Wendell, mm. he – no, he had one hit. But, yeah, he had a one-hit game today. And Joey Wendell is someone that I just wanted to quickly talk about because he is able to get uh, some good hits. And he's actually hitting over 250 and 252 right now. And after an awful start to the season and a very small sample size, Marlins fans were quick to jump to DFA Wendell, bring yep. someone else up. Xavier Edwards is better. Uh, Jacob Amaya, Jordan Groshans, we'd rather see them get a chance in the majors, but Wendell, who also had a hit yesterday as well, he came into the game as a pinch hitter, so he had a hit today and a hit yesterday, but Wendell, he's been really serviceable for the Marlins. I wouldn't say great, but I'd say above average, and he's been able to provide some defensive value. He's really been above average as a defender and above average at the plate, too, able to get uh, some good singles. He got, he also had one hit in yesterday's game, so he had, I mean, on Monday's game, sorry. So he had one hit in all three of the games. He's very consistent. I feel like he's able to provide you almost one hit every game. And I honestly like Joey Wendell. I don't see him going anywhere at the deadline. And I like him as our starting shortstop with also Amaya and Birdie getting some reps over there at the middle infield as well. So Wendell's not getting an overwhelming amount of playing time, but he's kind of sharing and leading the group of Birdie, Amaya, and Wendell and Hampson as well, playing some second base and shortstop. Yeah, great shout on Wendell. Like, he's he's really, since he came back from the IL, he's really put, putting it together, to be honest with you. Yeah. And, you know, we look kind of OPS-wise right now. Wendell, 687 OPS. It's not amazing by any stretch, but he was, he was putrid to start the year. It was so bad. So he's really trending. You've only got to look at Garrett Cooper there. One spot above him in the lineup today, Coop. It's got a 654 OPS. Wendell's out OPS in Garrett Cooper. Sean Barrett listening in. Sean, I'm sorry, brother. Numbers are the numbers. Wendell is out OPS in Garrett Cooper, which I didn't think would be possible this year. To your point, though, Ryan, like there was a lot of people on that bandwagon. Let's get Wendell out of here. You know, it's an expiring deal anyway. Let's just get out of him, move on, get one of the young AAA studs up. But no, the Marlins have stuck with him. He's delivered the defensive value, and the stick is starting to come around. Let me also just ask you about Jonathan Davis, mate. A multi-hit day today for Jonathan Davis. He hasn't had one of those since cause, granted. But I must say, Jonathan Davis, for me, he he's just become a bit of a locked-on Marlins favorite, to be honest with you. He's been a host favorite. I've just... I've really enjoyed watching him. I've really enjoyed the defense and the stability he's provided in center field. And I know Jazz is coming back soon, but... For me, Jonathan Davis has absolutely earned a roster spot here. I think he's going to be on the roster the rest of the year. Um, what's been your take of Jonathan Davis? Uh, well, I think Davis has been very solid. It's in question if he'll be on the roster the entire year, and that depends on what the future is for Avisayu Garcia and if oh De La Cruz and Sanchez are able to avoid some IL stints and, of course, Jazz, uh, if, how much he's going to be able to play on the active roster. He is on rehab right now, and I would expect Jazz to come back and join the Marlins after the Pirates series coming up when we start a road trip, another long road trip coming up for the Marlins, and Jazz expected to rejoin us. That'll be fun. But Davis, he's provided a ton of value, and it almost feels like even though it looks bad that he hasn't had a multi-hit game uh, besides today since Coors Field, he's been consistent, like Joey Wendell, getting one hit per game. He doesn't have a ton of 0 for 4. He does have some, but he doesn't have a ton of 0 for 4 or 0 for 3. Yep or 0 for 5 games. He's just consistently able to get one hit per game, usually a single. Again, not a great hitter, but not an absolutely garbage hitter. He's kind of been a mediocre hitter, I would say, but when he's uh, providing some speed, 
and he's also providing some really good defense out there in center field as our only true center fielder on the roster. Jonathan Davis gives us some value. He's currently hitting 258. I think it's that's from baseball reference. I think that's a little outdated because reference doesn't update till midnight tonight on the East Coast. Yep. But 275, I think, he's hitting, I think now. Oh, it, yeah, it went up a lot after this game. But yeah, Davis, again, he's been able to provide some value. The OPS plus, it's a little below average at 91. But when you're able to provide speed and defense, it makes him just an average player. And with his value on the Marlins, for the Marlins, I think being on the Marlins for him makes him an above average player with that center field and good speed. Uh, so I like Davis, and I'm hoping that he could stay on the roster for the rest of the year, but we'll have to see. But he's a very valuable uh, player and just doing what he does because, you know, he's not trying to be the superstar. He just plays his role pretty perfectly. He's like a basketball player who can only shoot. He's a sharpshooter, and he's able to play his role. Yeah, absolutely. I think the one thing that's that's kind of surprised me about Davis um, in a – and actually, this surprised me about Birdie, too. This surprised me a touch about, like, the Marlins in general this year, I'd say. That, like, Davis has been getting on base a touch. Like, there was, a, you know, a couple of times today he got on base. And thus far with the Marlins, only one stolen base for Jonathan Davis, which is surprising when, you know, today, uh, the point you were talking about stallings earlier, and I, I forgot to kind of follow up on this, but there was a, a, a pitch that Sandy threw, it was, I think, a change-up in, I think, I, I can't remember the hitter, but anyway, Kevin Kiermaier stole second base, and, he, you know, Stallings didn't even flinch. He was too busy trying to frame the pitch, Stallings, and he, he, did, he couldn't frame it. Yeah, and, I remember that. Yeah, and I, I kind of, it was, it, it kind of happened. I looked at it and went, okay, I don't know what kind of jump Kiermaier got. He, it may have been huge. I didn't see the replay on it, but literally, by the time Stallings was stopped framing, like, Kiermaier was on second, but the Marlins in general, I would say this year, their base running, their aggressiveness on the bases, particularly for stolen bases, has been surprisingly, you know, low, I would say. I don't know. I mean, I, I, Jazz is obviously pacing the club, but Jazz hasn't been around for like over a month now. And to be honest with you, I'm not seeing a ton of threat on the bases, which considering all the new rules is a little bit surprising, to be honest. What about you? Yeah, this is something that I actually really like to touch on because it's been a thought, kind of not a huge thought, but a thought in the back of my head for pretty much the entire season because I was expecting an even bigger year on the bases, especially for John Birdie, and yeah. nobody really knows why, nor has anyone really paid enough attention to really break it down. But I, if I was a Marlins reporter, I would talk to the Marlins coaching staff and John Birdie and ask if I had credentials. I would ask and try and figure out why is John Birdie not going because – his speed, his sprint speed has not gone down. He's still a very fast player. He's good at no. getting jumps and stealing bases. I don't think his skill has changed. It's just he's not being as aggressive. And it's been very frustrating and very weird. And same thing with Davis. We know he's capable of stealing. And I don't know how good he is at getting jumps and actually swiping bags. But I know he's very fast. So he should be able to uh, get quite a few stolen bases. And he only has one. That's very surprising with, according to Savant, his 91st percentile sprint speed which is pretty crazy I again I don't know what's going on and I really want to figure out why the Marlins aren't being aggressive on the base path because when Jazz was healthy I know mm. you said we haven't seen him in over a month but when he was healthy he was being pretty aggressive and yep. now that he's on the IL there's literally no one to be aggressive on this team it's very weird after Jonathan uh sorry John Birdie won the stolen base title last year that he's nowhere near the stolen base title this year yeah it is. It's kind of weird, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, if I had to say to you, listen, the, the U, Yuli Gurriel right now has more stolen bases than De La Cruz, Hampson, Jesus Sanchez, um, Jonathan Davis, obviously. You know, I don't know what's going on with the base running here. I know Birdie's got eight, but he's been caught a couple of times. It's just a bit of a weird wrinkle because across the league, it's up. You know, Ronald Acuna doing his thing with the Braves. Like, basically, Acuna just steals at will. Like, the way these rules are set up, the way the bases are, like, if you want to go and take the bag, pretty much you can take it. Like, it's almost like a riskless move. So, yet yeah, to your point, I, I wonder if this is more just um, managerial changes. Maybe this is something that Skip's looking for where he's like, do you know what? Let's not look to run as frequently. Maybe... 
where obviously Donny with with Birdie was pushing the ticket. Maybe you know the stop signs up a bit from Skip Schumacher. I don't know. It seems a bit strange that for the guys that look pretty athletic and the rules that are in place, they haven't been running. And for a team that rolls that is currently rolling a historic pace of grounded to double plays, this team should be running every time. Because right now, all that happens is, pretty much, they roll into these double plays. Something maybe fundamentally needs to change here to try and get themselves out of the double play situation um, and avoid that chaos because it's hurting them. So I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued, to be honest, to see and understand why that is. Uh, but Jonathan Davis, I think, is a really good case in point. The dude has got speed. He's built to stole bases, and he's only stolen one base. Don't know. Let's finish up here, though, mate, with um, Yuri Perez. Let's just finish up with just... I mean, listen, he's 20 years old. He's only seven years older than you. He's 20 years younger than me. And Yuri Perez is doing things right now that, I, I mean, I'm, I'm his biggest fan, one of them. I had high hopes for Yuri Perez, but to be honest with you, he's exceeded them. He's far exceeded them at this point. What's been your take on his early goings in the major leagues thus far? Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's crazy that Yuri Perez is only seven years older than me, and I'm pretty young. I'm probably one of the youngest Marlins fans out there besides Hayes Mish. But I expected <laughs> great I expected great things for Yuri Perez, but I did not expect this. I think a realistic expectation would be maybe a, a ERA around 3.50. Again, that's what happens with young rookies, and I did not expect him – to be pitching this deep into games, I expected consistently him to be going five, but now he's shown during his last two outings that he's able to go six because his pitch count has been very manageable. And if he wasn't under this pitch limit, I'm sure if he was maybe a little bit older, like 22 or 23, and he was pitching exactly like this with this type of pitch count per inning, he would be able to go seven or eight. And that intrigues me for the future because when Yuri is not on such a pitch limit, when the Marlins aren't being as cautious with him when he gets older, I am excited to see Yuri because he has potential to go and pitch some complete game shutouts in the future, next season yep. and the season after. So again, the sky is a limit for Yuri, like it says on the rundown. I am super, super excited about what Yuri Perez can do. And a 1.58 ERA, I think it is for Yuri. It's just been phenomenal and it's exceeded everyone's high hopes. And now it just makes you wonder all the time if Yuri can pitch like this in his age 20 rookie season, what can he do in in next season and the season after? How good can he possibly be? I'm saying he's a future Cy Young Award winner if he keeps this up, but time is going to have to tell. And, you know, the only fear would be that he, he gets some injuries. That would be the only thing that can stop him. That's how good this guy is. But Really uh, the Marlins have done a decent job at keeping their pitchers healthy with, of course, Sandy. And uh, Sandy has stayed healthy uh, during the past two or three seasons. And Lizardo stayed healthy this year. So we hope they can keep this up and that Yuri doesn't get an injury in the future because that's the only thing that can really stop him. He's so good. Yeah, it really is. Really is. It literally is the only thing. And, and right now, he's only going to get better. And let me tell you, this is the baseline, right? Six innings against the Blue Jays. The one of the elite offenses, by all accounts, in the American League, right? Six innings, three hits, nine Ks, no runs, no earned runs, obviously. And he did all that in 80 pitches, taking his ERA for the year down to 154. At 20 years of age, Uri Perez, the sky is the limit with this dude. And with that being said, I mean, I think maybe even before he made his debut, if not soon after that, Craig Mish put it out there saying there should be some conversation about an extension for Uri Perez right now, already, because we know what he is. And Ryan, you've called it. He is a future Cy Young winner or a contender, a regular contender. So it's only health that can ever hold him back. And that's just part of being a pitcher in Major League Baseball. But the Marlins have another great one here. They really do. And... I mean, he's got his next start queued up here against the Pirates. The Marlins have a four-game series against the Pirates. Let's just finish there real briefly before we get out of here. Four-game series against the Pirates. They've lost nine in a row. They they started the year in Fuego, and they've kind of like come back to earth a touch. 
The Marlins lost a funky one against the Blue Jays here, but four games against the Pirates. Yuri Perez is the bookend of that, I think, on the Sunday game. Um, you know, three, three out of four, I think, here for the Marlins would be the perfect, perfect antidote before they head on that road trip, right? Yeah, it would be. I'm really hoping for three out of four uh, in this series against the Pirates. I just said that before we started this show when I was talking with you uh, right when I came on, that I'm hoping for at least three out of four. Sweep would be a big bonus as the Pirates, they haven't been god-awful this season. They've been uh, kind of mediocre, but a little bit above expectations. They were off to that really hot start, and now they're just uh, doing decent. But the Marlins are more than capable of winning this series. And that's what you would hope for, because if you win three out of four, you're back to 10 games over going into a road trip where you will go to Boston, Massachusetts, which should be a really fun one at the iconic Fenway park. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the expectation should be three out of four. The pirates, they, they've really struggled with their pitching and their rotation. I'd say like they, they've got a couple of injuries knocking around. This is there for the Marlins to plow into, I think, and to win this series. Um, you know, the Pirates, they're scuttling three out of four, gets them back over over that 10-game threshold. Yes, it does. There'll be 11 games over 500 if that is the case, if, I, if I'm doing the maths right. It's been a long night, so we'll see. Um, let's call it a day there. That's 30 minutes of fire. Uh, firstly, thanks to everyone for making Lockdown Marlins your first listen, guys. I appreciate you for joining me on a Wednesday Yes, it was a disappointing series, a disappointing defeat. The question about what is up with Sandy, I think will be rectified soon enough. I've seen enough with Sandy to know that the corner will be turned at some point and we will get Cy Young Sandy back. Uri Perez is absolutely blowing my mind right now. And also what is blowing my mind is how amazing Ryan is. I must say, for those that are listening and don't have the graphics to help, make sure you follow Ryan at Marlins Ryan, ASAP, one of the best young baseball minds out there. And um, I absolutely enjoy and love him joining me on this show. And so guys, make sure you follow Ryan. Um, he is, he is an upcoming superstar, no doubt. And uh, when I hang it up on locked on, maybe there's uh, maybe Ryan will take it over. I don't know. That could be next year, by the way, we'll wait to <laughs> see um, guys. Of course it's a daily pod. So, you know, the drill Thursday back in the seat and Sean Barrett, the UK goat will be with me tomorrow and there'll be Pirates talk, and also there will be London series talk. I know it's not Marlins related, but it's big news here in the UK. So me and Sean Barrett, the UK go, digging into that Cubs-Cardinals series as well. And we'll see you then, guys.